Senate President and Lieutenant Governor from the Eastern Panhandle, creating jobs, cutting taxes, making West Virginia great again, right there for Senate. In studio with Larry Schultz, whose mic is way off of where his mouth would be. I don't know if that's going to make a difference <laughs> oh, or not. Oh, that's not going to really bother me too much. <laughs> great to be here. Appreciate you adjusting that, Lawrence. Happy Groundhog Day, by the way. Thank you. That'll be the theme of our intros today, uh, in case you were wondering, and I'm sure you weren't. Uh, and Mike Carl joining the show as well. Good morning, Mr. Carl. Good morning, everybody. And via telephone in the Joe Ferretti telephone throne, it is Ken Matson. Ken, back-to-back weeks. Uh, pretty soon we'll have to put you on the payroll, bro. Uh, no, good morning. Hope you're going to play that Sonny and Cher this morning. <laughs> it's, a, it's a good idea. <laughs> it is. Uh, but I won't be. Uh, uh, again, uh, we are from where I am and the computer I'm using. We are on Facebook from a different account that I don't have the control over, so I can't delete what I want to delete. But I, I issue another warning to anybody who's a candidate for office: if another candidate is on the air doing an interview, you cannot come on in the comments section and make personal attacks against that candidate. If you want to disagree on policy, that's a different thing, uh, but, but no personal attacks on your opponent who's on the air, and no campaigning for yourself while you're on the air. Uh, I mean, uh, in our comments section. We don't allow campaigning in the comments section, so if I had the power to delete, I would delete Alex Gasrud's comment this morning, but uh, I'm not on the correct account to be able to do that. So. But let Just me. A note. Uh, but I was impressed, as always, how the our chat room group self police they jumped on him pretty hard for what they viewed to be very inappropriate comments. Yes, well done. Uh, campaign on your own time. Uh, what, and you're a guest. You're here on the microphone. You're welcome to conduct your campaign, but not in our comment section. All right, so as uh, we were, uh, mentioned, it is uh, Groundhog Day, and uh, we'll get off with the introductions here. And we go a little something like this. As such. Hit it. We gather once again, and when I say again, I mean like we've done for a healthy dose of disagreement packaged to you as fun. And if it seems like we've done this before, well, what can I say? You're living the same show one more time. It's Groundhog Day. If it's not a second Friday of the month, it means Mike Carl is here. He's been on this crew the longest before he had gray hair there. Each Friday, Mike brings it as our most tenured Air Studio resident. And each Friday, he's got a lot of material because Joe Biden is still president. <laughs> Gives you a lot to work with. Her. The gift that keeps on giving, Mike. Larry Schultz is living his same old, same old days. Once again, waking up and once again, not having to shave. And that saves Larry at least five minutes of valuable time so tight that he uses to argue with Mike Carl via text every Thursday night. <laughs> you, guys, you guys brought Ken Matson right into that last <laughs> night. Yeah. You all right there, Kenny? He, he still doesn't oh, I'm understand pretty, I'm that, that was all about him. I'm good. I to be the mediator him. in that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know a few things will repeat, and I know these things for sure. Like no matter what, for my persistent cough, there is apparently no cure. I also know that I get light when I plug a lamp into a receptacle. And I know every day in our comment section, Ken Matson is posting something skeptical. <laughs> Good morning, Kenny. Good morning. Right on. Right on. Right on. Groovy. <laughs> Living the same day every day isn't always such a bad thing. Not when your success keeps repeating and adds to your bling. If it's yet another day and yet another salute for this fine fella, this morning John Gilstrap arose to write another New York Times bestseller. Yes, I did. Just three and a half hours and I was done. What are you on, 28 now? Yeah. 28, I, right? Yeah. I thought, sure, the rhyming word was going to be novella. No. You know, <laughs> however, the, the actor that played Father Guido Sarducci was Don Novella, if you remember Father yes. Guido Sarducci, right? He was also oh, in I mean, live. Yeah, Godfather 3. Uh, you got your Punxsutawney Phil, your Staten Island Chuck, and your French Creek Freddy. And in this show, we've even gotten prognostications from Joseph Joey Tots Ferretti. But on this prediction, I remain strong and I will not yield. This morning, Bill awoke to his shadow, so we get six more weeks of stubble fields. <laughs> How lucky you are, Rob. <laughs> well, I'm fortunate, Bill. <laughs> I'm fortunate. Now, in the absence of Mr. Ferretti, I uh, typically will uh, default to our telephone guest for the opening segment. Uh, Mr. Matson. are you up for the challenge? 
Yes, sir. The Let's last time I gave that. it to Bill, we needed two questions to fill up the opening <laughs> did, segment. <yeah>. So, <laughs> Thanks, Rob, for going to somebody else. <laughs> I have a few, but I won't go to the Sheriff Army one, so I'm going to go with um, my second one. So Trump has now taken credit for the current economy. Uh, why, his, why he has and from what we've been hearing these last few years, should he be taking the blame for the inflation as well? And now that it's, it, to him the economy is good, does anything he has to do, anything he has to get on Biden is the, is the is tanking the immigration bill? Discuss. All right. So uh, you have a, you have three different things there to discuss. Uh, so let's start first with Trump taking credit for the economy. Does he also then get blamed for the inflation? Mike Carl, how about you? Well, he's taking credit for the economy because he fostered and promoted and defended the free enterprise system which is overcoming the horrible uh, recessionary spending and, and inflationary promoting uh, spending of, of the Biden administration that followed him. He also uh, got us through the worst part of the, uh, you know, the big epidemic. And uh, so, so I think he should take plenty of credit. That's why I support him, not because of his his appealing style. <laughs> Larry, I'm sure you agree with Mike. Uh, no, not not exactly. <laughs> um, one of the one of the things I recall from the Trump presidency uh, was when they passed a two trillion dollar relief COVID relief bill, and he insisted on on putting his own name on every check. Somewhere there are still photocopies of those checks. When are we going to fess up to the idea that he ran $8.3 trillion of new debt into our economy? This was not an efficient system that he ran. It was a mess. Um, okay, so uh, when we lean back and take a look at this, it is hysterically funny to me to watch half of the Republican Party blaming Joe Biden for the terrible economic conditions that we now have, and the other half, or maybe 48%, uh, saying, oh, wow, this is great, and, and Donald Trump's uh, the one who did it. Um, that simply, I mean, there's always that move from one president to another, and you don't know what's been set up, um, but... Joe Biden has passed some pretty historic legislation that has driven a lot of jobs in Republican states and Democratic states. I saw uh, a Republican lawmaker just the other day who had voted against uh, one of the big infrastructure, the CHIPS Act, I think, uh, who was bringing money to these little towns and handing it out uh, and saying, you know, aren't you glad I'm able to bring this money to you? She voted against the bill, okay? So she didn't want to have that money, and she didn't bother mentioning that she opposed the bill. Uh, afterwards, the reason I saw it was there was an interview in which the guy confronted her with her vote, and she got really angry about being confronted by that. You can't help but think that that's a little bit dishonest. Donald Trump is is functioning in the same sphere, Uh you could look outside and see it raining at your house. He could be across the street and tell you it's a sunny day or it's going to snow later. Uh, and there doesn't seem to be very much follow-up on whether what he says is the truth, except in the court system now. Larry, as I thought, you, you agreed with Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Admiral. Okay. It's, uh, it's, it's hard to sort out who's – gets credit who does not get credit it's a continuum so everything that we do is influenced in some part by a previous administration but with that being said i think biden does deserve credit on several fronts whether trump's trying to take credit or not is well he can he can choose to it's it's up to us to whether to give him credit or not uh, but unemployment uh is probably at a 50 uh, 50 year low that's pretty impressive. Uh, Friday's data on inflation were uh, 2%, if you want to annualize it, uh, uh, if that carries over for the year. 2% and a soft landing. That is impressive as well. Uh, 
Gas prices are coming down, especially if you drive an EV like I do. I don't worry about it, uh, but, ga- but gas prices are coming down. Uh, the economy is looking better than it did a few uh, few months ago. Uh, Biden tried to take credit for it earlier in his campaign, and it fell flat. People are not uh, resonating with it. Uh, even though he's probably right in a lot of what he says, people are not giving credit. So you notice he's backing off. He's a, he's doing other things. He's attacking other other aspects of it. I think the, uh, uh, the election is going to be interesting. It's going to come down to... Uh, f- Four issues of which economy is going to be one. Right now, as I said, Biden's looking uh, uh, more favorable than he did a few months ago. The border is going to be very interesting, southern border. Uh, if the if Langford, Senator Langford and his colleagues can get through a meaningful package, that's going to be taken off the table. Uh, if they're not, if Trump is successful in getting lobbying the Republicans not to vote against it, that is going to be a talking point during the election. Abortion will, be, will continue to be a, a talking point. But I think the real issue, the one that's going to get more attention than anything else, is going to be the reaction of the young voters to the Middle East war. And right now they are walking away from Biden the way that he's handling uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Middle East war, especially his relationship with supporting Israel as opposed to taking a more hard stand against the destruction that's happening in Gaza. So I think those four issues will play a major role, but keep your eye on the Middle East and what the young folks will be doing. It's interesting, Bill, your points about the economy because – The recent poll that was uh, just released yesterday uh, showed that Associated Press NORC Center for Public Affairs Research, 35% of U.S. adults call the national economy good. Only 35% approve of Joe Biden's job as president, or 38%, I should say, and only 35% approve of the way he's handling the economy despite the numbers you just cited. Well, no, what I also said, it was not resonating with the people. Yeah, that's my, yeah. and I'm giving you the exactly. numbers to yeah, prove it. Yeah, exactly. And uh, uh, as I understand, before the, uh, the Stubblefield event uh, a couple of weeks ago at, at Shepherd University, uh, one of the panelists was was had been a leading Republican pollster for years. He just recently retired. He's also a bestseller author. Uh, but uh, discussion on very informal with him before the event started. He made the comment that it takes there's a lag time of four or five months before people really accept what the economy is doing. And he was saying that in his view, by mid to late summer. The populace will under will better appreciate the the good position of the economy than what they do today. He says elections today, the economy is is as poor. It's not going to work in his favor, but during late summer, it probably will work in his favor. Now, this is a Republican pollster that's been doing that for 35 years or so, and he has a lot more knowledge than I do. Mr. Gilstrap. Oh my goodness. Um, <clears throat> What's the line from my cousin Vinny? What that guy said? <laughs> what that guy said? <laughs> the, um, the other one is, well, that explains the hostility. Yeah. Right. The, whether Trump claims credit for the current economy or, or not, I don't care. You know, it's, it's what politicians do. Um, in 2020, we had a national panic attack, and we vastly overreacted to um, the, the pandemic. And we shut down the economy. So, of course, when you shut down the economy, you're going to spend a couple trillion bucks just to keep it you know, from, from flat, flatlining. Now, if you want to call that a disastrous bit of spending, fine. But at least it, it, the, the motivation behind it, as ill-considered as the entire reaction to COVID was, I, I, I give no one quarter there. But at least the thought behind the spending in in the Trump administration was to give life to the economy. The Biden trillions that came out, that was a giveaway. That was Green New Deal that nobody wanted. It's a Green New Deal that he lied about to Joe Manchin. It was strictly a way to infuse free money into the economy so that he can buy votes and and pay off uh, education loans and, and the ridiculous spending spree of of this administration the when we talk about the economy being good we have to figure remember where the economy is the markets are are recovering and i've i've had this discussion with with uh, phil mccoy on on mondays the the stock market is not the economy 
the stock market has recovered. And for those of us of a certain age and, and you know, have, have managed finances or whatever, everything feels good. But let's not forget that everything is 20% more expensive than it was two years ago. And that is not a little thing. So if people are feeling uncomfortable about the economy, the 35% that think it's good and then the, the vast majority who think it's not good is because it's not good. We've got trillions of extra dollars that we somehow have to absorb into the economy. And, and I put all of that, well, I'll, I'll give you a break. I'll, I'll put 75% of that, that bad karma at Biden's feet because he has mismanaged everything he's touched. Larry, you made a face. Um, I, I don't know how to address that except to say, um, you know, it wasn't Joe Biden who told us that this would be over by Easter. That was Donald Trump who totally, intentionally misled the nation about what we faced and then said, oh, this is a state matter. We'll let the states handle it. And genius say government. that when Biden then re-upped and didn't want anybody to go back to school. Remember, he, he extended the mask mandates long after all the evidence showed that it wasn't necessary. You can lay that at Donald Trump at the, at the initial panic attack. And again, I give no one quarter for that. That was a horrible overreaction across the board. But then extending it into the next well, administration, there was ample opportunity to fix actually, it. Actually, Donald Trump's sin was under an underestimation of what was about to happen. He did not prepare in any way. He turned it over to the states. Uh, you know, the next time we have a war, is that what the president's going to do? Say, boy, <laughs> the Japanese seem to be attacking. Uh, sorry, Washington, you better whip up that National Guard and get them ready to go. That was a national crisis, and we did not treat it that way. He treated it as well, New York can do this, and Florida can do that, and everybody just pick your own way. And, you know, 1.2 million people died, or 1.4, whatever the number is. Ken, it's a mess. Well, Ken, go ahead. Well, I'm kind of I'm kind of glad my economy went back to COVID, um, but um, I, I would love to have seen what the economy was if, if it wasn't, the COVID didn't happen, and, and really, I mean, I'll defend Trump in this regard. You know, he got hit with a bad bill of goods when this happened and you know his response can be debated um i know it, I, I would say it i would say overreaction because of all the people they had to make mass graves in new york so i wouldn't call COVID an overreaction i would call we, we need to make it <laughs> we need to take it seriously um i have two friends die from it so other than that um but yeah um you know i think the economy is on its way i think both both uh gentlemen can take credit for it um, in, in, in one small regard or the other. And, um, you know, again, the only thing left now is the border deal that now he wants to tank. So how many more terrorists in fentanyl do we want to keep on going around until November 8th? So part two, so, part two was the, was the border on that, Ken. So, uh, word the question for our panel regarding the border. So in order now that he can't get the, the economy going now tanking the immigration bill is that is only you know, talking point for the campaign now. All right, you got Gilstrap all warmed up. He's frothing like a dog looking at red meat. Go ahead, John. Biden started this with a pen. He can end it with a pen. He doesn't need Donald Trump. He doesn't need legislation. He needs to read re-sign the executive orders or unsign the executive orders. They canceled all the cures that we already had in place. It, it's absurd to lean on the Republican uh, House of Representatives and blame them for what is an executive action that he can take care of right away. But John, every time an executive order is signed, there is massive criticism that the president's overstepping his bounds. It's something that should be done by Congress. The our, our immigration policy slant to the southern border. Uh, I think there's uh, there's there. Both of them are interrelated very much so. Uh, it needs to be solved by Congress. And executive order can be overrun very easily, challenged by that. So if we're going to give the president the power and acceptance of executive order, let's give it to him. Let's don't let him criticize every time executive directive is, is made that you don't agree with. Michael, you've been the euphemistic you. Oh, go ahead, Kent. If Congress wants to defer their power to the president, fine. Resign from Congress, go home, and get a good job and, and pay taxes, right? You're there to make laws. We have a law 
we have a bill on the floor by the most conservative Republican in the Senate. He just got censored by his own state for negotiating with the Democrats over this border bill that he was assigned to do by Mitch McConnell. So you can't come back and say, oh, the president can just do this with a pen and give executive orders. Well, now he's a dictator. So, Congress, you make the laws. This has been going on for 40 years, over 40 years. We have something here. Let's sign it. Then we could deal with the people who have been in here for 11 years and et cetera. And then we, let's stop the flow now and stop pointing fingers and do your job. Thank you. Mr. Gilstrap, you're shaking your head now. It wasn't a crisis until it was started with an executive order. We had the border was plugged. We didn't have an issue. It was Biden who started this fire. Now it's become a, a, a conflagration. And he's trying to point to Congress as the reason why he can't put out the fire he started when, in fact, He's got the spigot. But, John, Trump ran on the crisis at the border. Everybody runs on yeah, crisis. Yeah, no. So you cannot say that the crisis started with Biden signing a uh, an order. You cannot say that because the current the crisis, crisis has been there. Well, yeah, but the current crisis, we've had a continuum of crisis for 40 years. Larry Schultz. The um, really troubling thing is now we see a Texas governor – and I always want to call him Bud Abbott. I can't imagine <laughs> why. Uh, we see the Texas governor calling in the National Guard, and they're actually uh, facing off with the Border Patrol and keeping them away from the border. Uh, the difficulty with that is it, it turns out it's a violation of federal law. Um, you know, there's a moment here um, similar to the time when Orville Faubus, if you recall him, governor of uh, Arkansas, decided to use his National Guard to stop the integration of the Little Rock schools. And he was a Democrat. That was bad. That's how long ago this was. And he uh, tried to do that. And this fellow named Dwight D. Eisenhower, 10 years after finishing up with the Germans and the Japanese, told him, look, I'm sending the 101st Airborne, and you're no longer the commander of the Arkansas National Guard. I am. And that took care of that. Um, I would love to see Joe Biden tell Ron DeSantis and and Bud Abbott, you're done. You, you know, we trusted you with this, and under usual circumstances, you have the power. But the courts have said that that in the right situation, the president has the power to seize control of that National Guard and order it to do, uh, to follow the law. Mr. Carl, you're... you're, the, you're the, Ongoing reference to the National Guard, let's think of the words. It's to guard the nation, number one, not, you know, not internal right. issues. But Why are they conflicting with the Border Patrol, who's also uh, the, charged the, with that same duty? The, 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 and all this stuff about executive orders and, you know, governmental process, the, without a doubt, the President of the United States has a primary duty to protect America from invasion, and he's not doing it. And you don't have to have uh, immigration reform. We need it, and it is related. But first and foremost, you have to protect the nation against invasion, and Biden's policies and his uh, as has been has been well pointed out is intentionally weaken that protection. Kenny, comes back to you for the final minute. When will we stop using this as a political issue and get the job done? Thanks. All right, you didn't need the whole minute. You only needed about five seconds of it. All right, good job. <laughs> Excuse me. Good job getting us kicked off here to start the program. I yield the floor to Bill. Bill, <laughs> time to prepare. Time to prepare. Got I'll, a commercial break coming up. Right? See, that go to the restroom, one of the two. I would do both if I was you. <laughs> <laughs> prepare while you're in the restroom. Just don't hand us the papers you oh, need to prepare. There's some multitasking for you. <laughs> Great place to think. This segment of the show brought to you by Orsini's Home Store, not just an appliance store any longer, 360 Hack Wilson Way Martinsburg at Orsini's.com. Also by the Berkeley County Health Department, where you can get your free radon test kit today. This is Talk Radio, WRNR Martinsburg.
At the Berkeley County Health Department, our motto is prevent, promote, protect. Since 1935, our mission has been to provide clinical and environmental services to protect the health of the general public. We're committed to building public health in our community by offering a wide range of services, including blood pressure screening, breast and cervical screening, family planning, counseling, lab testing, and more. We perform health inspections to make sure the restaurants you visit are clean, and we prepare and coordinate plans to respond to all hazards. The Berkeley County Health Department, 122 Waverly Court, Martinsburg. Mommy, where does flavor come from? Well, um, when people love food, they cook it on a Traeger grill. Meat, corn, even pie. <laughs> and then the Traeger does the rest, which brings everyone to celebrate this beautiful thing that they've created. Because when you share delicious food with your friends, that's the flavor of life. Shop now and save at Orsini's today. Mother Shuckers, the only place to get your fill of Bay Delights in Martinsburg. Located at 1014 Winchester Avenue, Mother Shuckers has everything you crave, from crabs to crab legs. Specialty suits, chowder that will fill your belly and heart with goodness. Mother Shuckers, we give a shuck on how well you eat. Mother Shuckers, we give a shuck. If you don't like it, shuck it up, buttercup. Here's to the grown-ups. Your car is now your office. Stage. Nursery. Shh. Sorry, insuring it shouldn't be a headache. Erie, number one in the nation for highest satisfaction with the auto insurance purchase experience six years in a row. And with Erie, you get your own independent agent. Not a giant corporate call center or some online robot. You meet with a real person like this. Your local Erie agent in Martinsburg is Smallwood and Small Insurance. Get a quote at smallwoodandsmall.com. Erie Insurance. I do. I do. We got double the Rock's gas rewards, six cents off a gallon. I can't believe you didn't fill up. That's double my rent. Not my car. Bye. Save now with double the gas discount, six cents off a gallon with Rock's rewards. We got double the Rock's gas rewards, six cents off a gallon. You had one job. It's between girls. <laughs> Save now with double the gas discount. Six cents off a gallon with Rocks Rewards. Panhandle Printing and Design is your full service local print shop. With over 50 years of combined experience, we know how to handle all of your printing and design needs. We can handle anything from small business cards to wrapping large vehicles. Our in-house design team can do it all. As a staple of this community, we love helping people promote their events, businesses, and anything they're passionate about. Envision, create, and bring your ideas to life with Panhandle Printing and Design. There's nothing quite like the Honda Accord Hybrid and the CRV Hybrid when it comes to exhilarating efficiency. With hybrid technology and thrilling capability, these vehicles deliver an electrifying performance on every drive. But what truly makes these hybrids special is the unwavering determination that inspires everything we do. Redefine your driving experience with Honda, KBB.com's best value brand of 2023. CMA's Honda of Winchester, 3985 Valley Pike. CMA's moving lives forward. Based on 2023 brand image awards from Kelly Blue Book, visit kbb.com for more information. Do you have someone in a nursing home or are you worried about somebody you love going into a nursing home? The law firm of Daniel Staggers can protect your assets. Call the law firm of Daniel Staggers today at 304-267-3915. The Daniel Staggers law firm does elder care law, estate planning, and special needs trusts for disabled children and family members. Visit the Daniel Staggers law firm for your initial free consultation at 133 East John Street in Martinsburg. The Daniel Staggers law firm, when you need asset protection for you or for a family member. Running for sheriff of Berkeley County. You singe bridges with uh, some of the voters. How will you go back? If you were to involve yourself with my relationship with Summit Point, I ask anybody to do it for you, and that's how comfortable I am with that. The relationship was completely legitimate. I campaigned on the fact that I would train there because our deputies got to go home and see their families at night. So if anybody is saying that there's a, anything questionable about anything within the petition that was filed, I would say you're just simply not paying attention because the Ethics Commission approved all of that. Until they give a written, it's not official. Of course. Yeah. In September, I called the Ethics Commission. I got the call logs for it. I'm pretty sure the attorneys and the Ethics Commission would not lie that they had those conversations. And I would hope to say that the uh, conversations in a state office like that are recorded. Please FOIA, whatever you want to FOIA. But that conversation did happen, and I did clear that. So if people still have opinions out there, they're ill-informed. 
Live from the Talk Radio WRNR studios, it's time for Eastern Panhandle Talk with Rob Mario. Thank you, Cliff Maxwell, and good morning and welcome back to the second hour of Eastern Panhandle Talk's Friday Groundhog Edition, brought to you in part by Oda Care Attorney Danny Staggers in downtown Martinsburg at 304 267 3915. And uh, CMA Honda in studio with, uh, by the way, I should say we are produced by the sports doctor, Colin McLaughlin. And now in studio with our uh, co-hosting team on this uh, fabulous Friday, New York Times bestselling author, John Gilstrap. Good morning. Senior member of our crew, Michael Carroll. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Lawrence Schultz. Good to be here. Via Good morning. T- via telephone in the uh, Joe Ferretti role, Ken Matson. Good morning. And leading us off with issue number two, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Bill- yeah. Ken's question uh, got us started off uh, in a very in- engaged, energized way. It carried over th- during off break. So people have uh, have expressed their, they've gotten red in the face, they've pounded on the table. It's been fun for the last minute and a half. I'm going to change the subject. Uh, and polarization is something we have begun that we see in every facet of our life. Uh, political scientists say, say that we're more polarized now than any time since the late 1950s, just prior to the uh, Civil War. Uh, a lot of arguments have been made what we can do to get rid of the polarization. Uh, most of it is uh, uh, everybody acknowledges that there's no silver bullet. There's no not going to be a quick fix. Uh, at the Stubblefield Institute the other night where we had three very esteemed panelists, someone made the comment that a simple approach to re- addressing the polarization, and they admitted it's not going to be a quick fix. Nothing's a quick fix. But these two approaches was one to resume teaching civics in our school systems. That was taught as a basic course when I was a kid, but it's no longer taught in the schools. The second one, which I find very intriguing, is to teach debate in our schools. Why debate? Two things. One, it teaches someone to frame the question, frame their position. And instead of just going off half cocked, they have an idea how they want to say it, how to make it more effective. But equally, if not more important, is teaches you to listen. That, to me, is one of our major major problems today. Commun- the lack of communication uh, contributes to our polarization. And a lack of, communica- lack of communication, I think, in large part, is due to the fact we have lost the ability, or we don't care anymore, to listen to the other side. So my question to my colleagues is, does this make sense, realizing nothing's going to be a, a quick fix? Or are there other solutions, more viable solutions, to addressing this problem that we have, this disease that we have of polarization? I'm going to begin in this. I have two attorneys who debate for a living, but I have somebody in here who actually uh, debated so well, he crushed a young lady and made her cry uh, during the debate, not because he called her names, but because he totally outflanked her and then put the hammer down to win the debate only to be penalized points. So if there's anybody that knows about polarization and debating, it's this guy, John Gilstrap. I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. Could you do the... Uh... <laughs> Your topic didn't interest me. No, I think that um, I was a district champion debater in high school, and I, it's actually life-shaping in the sense that it the the structure of a debate and it's a very structured thing there's a there's an affirmative and a negative whatever the topic is and both teams you don't know which side you're going to be on until the debate starts which means it puts you in a position where you have to understand the point of view of the other side which then not only breeds less contempt it makes it makes you understand the honest place that someone who disagrees with you comes from and that's what we have lost. General Walker uh, mentioned earlier today, you know, the days of the Ebbets Grill when people would go from both sides of the aisle and you sit down and have, have drinks and dinner together and argue like hell at, on, on the floor. And then you go and, and you have drinks together, much like what happens here in, in, in the studio. There's, there's, in some cases, there's violent agreement and sometimes um, there's violent disagreement. Mr. Hornby, if you're listening, just to be sure, we don't drink in between breaks here. Uh, <laughs> Gilstrap has tried to get us to, but this, we don't. This is, this is just coffee. Really, it's not. Um, so no, I think I think teaching debate would be a wonderful thing because it breeds empathy. It also brings clarity of thought, 
before you open your mouth, you have to know what you're going to say. Mr. Matson. Um, I, I love this idea. I, I benefited, oh, well, some say I didn't, uh, in debate in school, in high school. And I think it teaches not only if you get that particular class or it is a curriculum taught in your social studies or civics class, um, that uh, the student starts to learn how to use critical thinking skills and deductive reasoning skills and how to, what John said, was perfectly correct. You know, learn from the other side instead of calling names and everything else and debate the issue. And, you know, and that's where I think we've forgotten about being an American. And, and I'll say this, like, we can have arguments, but we're all still Americans, and we can agree just on that. Our, our country was founded on um, debate, and it might not have been formed if people didn't debate on the floor and see each other's views and finally make a constitution. So, um, you know, I, I really think I, – I, I really can't say much. I mean, John, I, what that guy said. <laughs> but you were listening, uh, you can. <laughs> yes. Mr. Schultz. Um, I've long thought that even before you get to the debate stage, from the very youngest ages, we should teach children public speaking. And the reason I say that is so many people that you meet are afraid of public speaking. I used to go to county commission meetings in Morgan County, and I'm sure there's no difference between them and anywhere else, years ago. And when an issue came up that got people fired up and they wanted to talk about it, you would see two behaviors. The men would get up, begin speaking in a normal tone, and pretty soon they're screaming and in many cases cursing <laughs> about the situation that they're talking about. The women would get up, and this isn't universal, obviously, but some of the women and some of the men would behave this way. The women would get up, and because they were, it was touching their heart, whatever this issue was, uh, they would, because men are not allowed to do this, they would actually begin to show emotion, and sometimes weeping. Um. Neither of those is a particularly effective way to make a public point. We notice that the most convincing speaker is the person who's, you know, certain that, that he's uh, correct and will lay out the reasons so you can follow his, his logic, but who does so from a bit of a distance without letting either anger, which is a substitute emotion for the real emotion men are supposed to feel, uh, or, um, um, you know, sadness or, or dismay. And, and it, what I'm saying is you could make county commissions and other lower level, uh, legislative sorts of bodies really move. If the people in the audience, a good number of them have those skills, debate would build on those. I think if you're going to have effective debate in the later years, you got to start in third grade teaching public speaking. And, you know, it can't be that difficult. Most people you talk to are terrified of it. Terrified. And they wouldn't mind talking to you. They I don't want to get up there and talk into you know, a microphone to a, 800 people. I'm not going to do that. But, um, be, but the record show we have a bigger audience than 800 people, by the way. Keep going there. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it, it's easier on the radio because the only people whose reactions I have to worry about are these four people who are sitting here. I don't get to see the reactions of our of our, our viewers or listeners. And uh, so that's not as likely to make me um, react somehow. Mm -hmm. um, but if we could just teach public speaking, I'd, I'd, I'd satisfy myself with that for now, um, simply because it makes you a better citizen if you can stand up and simply, without emotion, tell your story and why you believe what it is you believe in this county commission meeting. Mr. Carl. Well, I, I certainly believe that uh, you know, free speech and open access to comment, 
to making comments is, is a fundamental value of America. It's one of the it's one of the great things about America, and we ought to recognize that the, the limitation of that right and encouragement is one of the things that characterizes many of America's enemies, and some of the some of the countries that are uh, pressing against us, even though. Some Americans are using their their free speech to support those countries, but it's but it is still a fundamental American value, and I t- completely agree that it would you know I- emphasize that it would would be a good thing. Billy comes back to you. Yeah, whatever the mechanism is, I think the schools need to play a, a more important, a more major role in addressing this polarization. Something's got to. And hopefully we do not have an, uh, we do not mimic what we had in the 1850s, which resulted in a civil war. Uh, we have to find some way to develop mutual respect. It's awfully easy to say, but it has to be ingrained. So I think it goes back to what Larry said. It's got to be at an early stage, an educational. I do not see the schools really taking on the polarization issue as strongly as I think they should. I think it's quite the opposite. In fact, I think that the the idea of silencing students or teachers or whomever that, that says something that makes students uncomfortable, and not at the elementary level, I'm talking about the collegiate level, you hear about people being canceled and, and uh, speeches being canceled, speakers needing to have security details because of what they're about to say. We're starting to normalize this activity. And I, I blame the keyboards, the the Twitter you know, the, the, the keyboard warriors, because there's no consequence to that. But what we've done, the, the growth of echo chambers has really endangered, Carl, what you're, Mike, what you're talking about with the um, uh, protecting free speech. We all tend to go hang out with people that believe what we believe, and then we can get truthy, don't have to deal with truth, kind of, you know, go with the punchlines, and we're not going to be corrected by the, the folks who support us. You need to have that interaction that, that whoever's on the other side of an argument, whatever the argument is, is not a fool. The person on the other side of the argument who's just as passionate as you are is coming from an honest place. You might not agree with their, their data set, but at least they're coming from an honest place, and we need to start respecting that. Yeah. Let me pick up on that. It's awful easy, John, to say respect, got to respect, got to respect. That is kind of the fallback in every argument. But how do you make that happen? People respect you, as you mentioned, the, cha- uh, the chamber, uh, uh, voice chamber. They respect you if you agree with them. If you don't agree with them, then they don't respect you. So to me, that's a very shallow argument. We've got to find something to go back to make respect more achievable, make it respect something that we can, in fact, gather. We might can note here at 9.17 a.m., Bill <clears throat> said he does respect Gilstrap. <clears throat> that's what I heard. That's what I heard that's out of that. Heard. <laughs> While also saying we should all have a tone of civility. Okay. Thank you, Bill. All right. Uh, Mike, uh, there, there, there's, a, there's a difference between... Uh, respecting their right to express their position and respecting the substance of their position. And th- and that difference is critical. Kevin, Kenny, you've been trying to say something. Yeah. Um, you know, we get this debate, and you guys brought up really good topics. And a lot of times, you saw a general, he was being uh, in Congress, I, I think it was General Milley, and he was getting chastised by reading – you know, Mao Zedong and the communists and the fascist papers and things like that, so we could better understand history and to better understand the forces in the world. And then he was called all kinds of names. And then we have Republicans that want to, hey, independents, join us, join us. But then when they join you or they get elected, they're called rhinos because they're a little more moderate, right? So this is where the debate falls apart, is that, again, what the panelists said, that um, if you have a disagreement or a different view, it automatically goes to you're a rhino. Instead of coming together and find some common viewpoints and doing what's good, if you're an elected, an elected official, do what's good for the, the people you represent. And, you know, what, what happened to the days of all these good debates that happened that we saw back in the 80s? I mean, they were heated, but they were good debates. Those are gone now. It's all name calling. And that's unfortunately where we're at now. And our leaders have to set that example in regards to being civil to each other and respecting our opinions. 
I don't mind if if a fascist, you know, or, or a white supremacist goes to a college and starts speaking. Hey, whatever. That's up to you if you want to attend and, and listen. But that's where really the big social debates come into is is the co- college area, and you know, broaden the minds and make your opinions. So. Uh, it has to start somewhere, and I think it has to start in early schools and then work its way up. But our leaders have to be an example as well. Final word goes back to you, Bill. I, uh, yeah, I uh, I thought it was a good discussion. Uh, it is, it's uh, not going to be an easy problem to, to solve. There's no silver bullet to address our polarization. Uh, we have a lot of different opinions. But – we need to start taking it serious how we can uh, address the polarization issue. And in the schools will be one. There's probably a dozen other ways to do it as well. But we've got to look at polarization as a problem and trying to eradicate it. All right. Are you done insulting Gilstrap now, Bill? <laughs> I just wanted to say I thought that was the stupidest thing I've ever heard. So. <laughs> And you're wrong, John. You're wrong. I don't respect you because of it. <laughs> All right. Uh, issue number three now. We go to Mr. Gilstrap. All right. <clears throat> By way of polarization. Um, in 1939, the MS St. Louis famously it was a ship that was filled with 900 European uh, Jews seeking asylum from, from the Holocaust. Uh, nobody would take them. It approached the United States. It sailed around for, for months, I believe. FDR refused to, uh, to let them seek asylum in the United States. We sent them back to Europe, to Nazi Europe. Um, for years, Democrat administrations have fought the movement of the Israeli capital to Jerusalem. That was done by, by Trump and it was going to supposedly cause all kinds of wars. Maybe it did. Maybe, maybe it contributed to the current situation, but it was it at least had the courage to do it. Now we've got Democrats in government academia that are siding with Hamas terrorists over the Israeli victims of, of the current, you know, the, the October 7th uh, invasion. What's happening? Uh, it, it seems like if and, and we all have our different news sources, right? But it just seems to me between the protests, I think, Bill, you mentioned it, the protests the, in favor of Hamas, and there's no moderate wing of Hamas, um, that, that it seems like the Democratic Party, the Democratic movement has become largely anti-Semitic and it, it, in, in the body politic and also in academia. What do you all think? All right. So, are you asking why that's happened, or if is if, if, if and that why? Is, if that I is mean, that, if my, if you disagree with my observation, I'd love to hear it. But if there's an underpinning here that I find disturbing. All right, Bill, you had your yeah, hand up first. Uh, you keep uh, you you made the point that is Democrat Democrat here, but put the uh, uh, the the vessel in the 1938 in perspective. Uh, over 70 percent of the country at the time wanted to stay away from any engagement to, in Europe, over 70 percent. And Roosevelt tried to uh, tried to get some meaningful talks, uh, but he was rebuffed in large part by the Congress. The Congress was a Republican Congress made up with Southern Democrats. So I agree with you that we should not we should have been more welcome with that. But I do disagree with the premise that it was a Democrat led. It was the country mood at the time. Now, okay, let me let me go with my other points. Uh, and the other thing is about the. Uh, uh, Hamas. I my read of the reaction of the country is not so much pro Hamas because no one, no one that I've ever talked to will support what Hamas did on whatever day it was, the 6th of October, 7th. October the 7th. No one will support that. That was horrendous by any standards. Where there's some pushback, where there's some reaction is what is viewed as the overreaction on the part of the Israeli leadership. They, uh, instead of trying to find a way to punish or to ferret out the, uh, the Hamas leaders, they have chosen to basically bomb into close oblivion the uh, the uh, the any semblance of society in the Gaza Strip. So, John, I don't think it is a evidence of anti-Semitism as it is the fact that they are re- uh, repelled about the overreaction. And by the way, I, I'm a firm believer, without any knowledge except what I hear and see on the news media, that this was a plan on the part of Hamas to get Israel to over to react the way they did. And if that was a plan, they were it's correct in doing it. And because the uh, pop, the uh, support of of Israel has dropped 
precipitously uh, since uh, since the, the Moss action. So I don't know what caused it, but if it was designed, they achieved what they wanted because Israel is no longer has the popularity that it had a few months ago, Across, not only in the U.S., but globally. Michael. Well, first, first of all, I didn't understand your, your that background thing you talked about back in the 30s <clears throat> where uh, uh, the uh, – Congress was Republican, but it was le- and Southern Democrat. Oh, and, and some Democrat. And, and, no, Southern Democrats. And some and Southern Democrats. Yeah, okay, yeah, right. I, yeah, I thought yeah. you were mixing those. No, 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 no. Uh, that that was a makeup. Okay, so so <laughs> you you were just acknowledging that there were some Democrats involved. No, in- I was acknowledging there were Southern Democrats. Okay, and uh, and the two I'm um, allied, right. they were more politically aligned than uh, okay. they would be to say today. Okay, but 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 first of all, the idea. That that Israel has mishandled the defense of its own existence is is ridiculous. Uh, there is no limit on what you ought to do to preserve the existence of your nation, uh, and and that is what is expressly being threatened by by uh, the Hamas and and in effect by Iran and all the people that are trying to destroy destroy Israel. So, so there isn't some nuance or or style or that that ought to be adjusted. In fact, the the firmer the the response, the earlier the firm response, the better. Mr. Schultz. Yes. Um, it's funny that we're you. reaching back to 1939 and to the FDR administration when, right at this very moment, there is a bill pending in the House uh, and the Senate that would uh, work on the border, provide funding to Ukraine, and don't forget this next one, provide funding to Israel. How's that bill being stopped from becoming law? Republicans are stopping it from becoming law in the House of Representatives by stalling the whole deal. So. If we're going to say the lack of support for Israel is a sign of anti-Semitism, then I think modern-day Republicans have some splaining to do because Mike Johnson and the House are holding it back right now. Right now. This is a time when Israel really needs those funds. Too bad. Too bad. Joe can't make the deal. All, all, all you're talking about is, is uh, legislative gamesmanship. And it has nothing to do with the Republicans' absolute clear support for the continuation of Israel and its existence. And 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 now I have a problem with the with with the uh, Ukraine part. There are some what I call neo isolationists on the Republican side that are you know not real you know are playing games. They're playing the political uh, legislative game with that. But but there should be absolutely I, I totally reject that there's any true Republican opposition to the maximum defense of Israel. The maximum defense of Israel would include passing this bill, and they have said they're going to kill it with Trump's help. And 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 that's because of legislative gamesmanship, where they've tied that to something else. We don't need that bill to. St- to so, save it, help save Israel. So the House is so concerned about legislative gamesmanship that they're willing to be labeled as anti-Semitic. No, by by a, you, a the, 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 being, I, I, you can you can call me anti-Semitic all you want. It doesn't change the facts and the law. And You're the, not in the House and the reality. But 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 and and again, I I'm not just you know blindly republican because i recognize there are republicans who are playing games with the ukraine issue but to package all this thing and in fact we don't need any bill whatsoever to protect the border we need the president of the united states to do his job mr matson via telephone i remember not too long ago my party in dc said you want money to israel and ukraine you attach it to the border bill. There was no standalone bill. Nothing. Now we have a bill, and who's tanking it? I have to agree with Larry on this. Make a separate bill. But going back to Hamas. So 
all the images we received on any news agency was what Hamas wanted us to see, to create a reaction. On social internet, we already know that Iran and Russia are in cahoots. Russia's giving stuff, I mean, Iran is giving arms to Russia, et cetera. So now we have Iran, who also funds Hezbollah and Hamas, sending out propaganda and, and et cetera, and, you know, causes interesting debate. But this is all that some people are seeing and are influenced. Now, I haven't seen, correct me if I'm wrong, and show me somewhere it is, where we have students, et cetera, people in Congress, supporting Hamas. No, they're supporting the way, I would say supporting. They are concerned at the way that Israel is basically conducting the way they're protecting themselves. And I'm, I'm, with, I'm with Mike. Hey, you hit me, I'm hitting you back in, in, in regards to this situation. So how do they go about it? You can't send pamphlets down and send whatever type of information you can and say, please, civilians, go to this area. And then they bomb it. Now, did Hamas take advantage of that? Absolutely, because Israel got gamed again. So how do you go about it? This is a very, very hard thing. But we also know that there were some on the, on the, in the Israelis that they want to just basically land mow down Gaza and create even more Israel territory. Okay, well, that's up to debate. But then we see a different structure in what they want done. I'm not saying not to defend yourself. But not all Palestinians are Hamas. Yeah, they got controlled by Hamas. Does that mean all the Iraqis were Saddam Husseinites? No, they were oppressed. And then in that type of the world, if you kill one of my family members, and this is tribal, then I must go out and seek revenge. That's just the way it is over there. It's something we don't understand over here. So I'm, not, I'm agreeing with Mike that Israel should go all to the wall and take out Hamas. But we also have to be considerate. We don't do things like we did in World War II and firebomb a whole city and kill innocent Germans who were not Nazis, right? So there's going to be collateral damage. So how do we learn from that and drop the, uh, the innocent? So they work for us. They work for Israel and say, hey, these guys are terrorists. They're, they're in that building over there. So... Um, but to but to throw at the this the Democratic Party, listen, we got we got Gosar and and uh, uh, Green going to unite the right uh, events, propaganda. So you know, uh, what's, I can't remember his name. Um, Fuentes. It wasn't unite the left. It was unite the right. And Joe Pompeo, the, the communist socialist that he is, said Green and Gosar shouldn't be playing footsies with anti-Semitic. Uh, groups. So, you know, what do we do here? So it's not a Democrat Republican issue. It's a company that you keep, right? So if you want to support Israel, support Israel. Don't go, our fires are caused by Jewish space lasers and the Holocaust was fake, etc. Because <laughs> what does that do? It doesn't do anything. It just puts more mud in the water than what we really need to do and try to find a, a, some kind of peace in the Middle East. Mr. Gilstrap closes to you. All right. <clears throat> I just... Got to poke the historical note again. FDR is a famous anti-Semite. And if you read the read some books by Eric Larson that are written in that era, the diplomatic orders given to the the U.S. diplomats in, in Germany and, and uh, Court of St. James, very clear that we don't, we don't want these people. I mean, that you can't be clearer than that. But again, that was what, 70 years ago. So... We've kind of wandered from the point. I don't want to reopen it again. The issues of anti-Semitism come from uh, the uh, senior leadership at Harvard at, at the Ivy League schools who can't say out loud that um, executing the Jewish state is a bad thing, that, that, that that's hate speech. That's just strange. We see Jewish um, students and campuses and Jewish people in cities being beaten be by pro-Palestinian protesters because they are Jewish. They are not the Jewish state, they are not Israel, they are Jewish, and, and they're being beaten up. There is this rise of anti-Semitism that I find really concerning. As far as the, the war at Hamas, or against Hamas is concerned, you know, it, it sucks to be a Palestinian 
who's ill in a hospital that happens to be headquarters for Hamas. It just, it's really bad. You're going to die. And you're going to die ugly. That's what war is. And when the, the, the professed vow of not just Hamas, but Iran is to destroy Israel, Israel has no choice but to destroy Hamas. And if there are civilians in the way of the military targets, it just, it's, that's too bad. And as far as the bombing of, you know, not all Germans were Nazis. Absolutely. But those who were working in the factories who were not party members got blown up with the, the people who were party members. That's why war is so ugly. This is why Hamas never should have poked this tiger. And once poked, the tiger is going to tear him apart. And I think it's great. And this segment of our show today, by the way, Larry, you're on the clock for issue number four. This issue, segment of our show brought to you by the Skinner Accident and Injury Lawyers. If you've been injured, contact the Skinner Accident and Injury Lawyers. They'll use all their resources to get you what you deserve. Find out more at SkinnerWins.com today. Our uh, theme music on the way out. Sid Vicious passed away this date, 1979. We are the Skinner Brothers. Most folks only need a lawyer once or twice in their lives. And when they're injured or in an accident, most people don't know what to do. We get it, it can be overwhelming. Nobody likes to be told, you need a lawyer, but that's why we're here. We wanna get you back to your normal life and help you recover. So if you or loved one has been in an accident, give us a call. Let us figure out how we can get you compensation. Reach us at SkinnerWins.com or Google Skinner Lawyers. We'll treat you like family. It's the age-old question we ask kids. What do you want to be when you grow up? Whether the answer is a police officer or a professional candy taster, West Virginia students in grades K through 5 can turn their dreams into a chance to win a $5,000 savings account with the Smart 529 When I Grow Up essay contest. Have your child share their dreams in 200 words or less for a chance to win. To enter, go to smart529.com. But hurry, the contest closes on February 23rd. Smart 529 is a program of the West Virginia State Treasurer's Office. The W.B. Rockefeller Neuroscience Institute Martinsburg Clinics have moved to a new location. Our RNI team has moved to a larger custom-designed suite on the third floor of the Spring Mills Medical Office Building at 61 Campus Drive. RNI teams now located in the new Spring Mills office include physical medicine and rehabilitation, neurosurgery, and neurology. We look forward to welcoming patients at this new location in Spring Mills. For more info, call 304-596-5038. With four new car dealerships and four used car dealerships in three states, Parsons is the largest used car and fastest growing new car dealer in the tri-state area. Take Parsons Ford with huge savings on hundreds of new Fords, financing from 0%, Parsons' goal of financing for all, and Parsons' famous above-market trade-in allowances that help make Parsons number one for used cars, too. See why so many won't buy anywhere but Parsons Ford in Martinsburg. We became number one by making you number one first. Parsons. From breathtaking outdoors to unique local eats, world-class geocaching, and thriving local culture, Martinsburg, Berkeley County, West Virginia is where you can live your adventure. Berkeley County offers fantastic outdoor experiences, from our rugged hiking paths to scenic nature paths, public parks, fishing streams, and nature preserves. Cap off your outdoor adventures with a stroll through historic downtown Martinsburg. Join us and immerse yourself in our rich local history and scenic surroundings. Check out upcoming events and plan your adventure at TravelWV.com. Finally, West Virginia is moving in the right direction. As your West Virginia Senate President, Craig Blair has passed the most conservative legislative agenda in the nation. He has fought for our values like banning elective abortions, protecting our Second Amendment rights, and prevented boys from playing in girls' sports. Senator Craig Blair championed the largest tax cut in the history of our state. Craig Blair, a strong conservative leader, promises made, promises kept. This election, vote for Republican Craig Blair for State Senate. Paid for by the committee to re-elect Craig Blair. This segment of our show today brought to you by Craig Blair for State Senate and also by the Mansion Ready Law Firm. Find out more at WBJusticeLawyers.com today. This is the birthday of one Graham Nash from CSNY, brought to you, uh, or born this day, 1942, as we move along. You know, in regards to our discussion earlier about uh, civics and debate and such and whether or not uh, that can work, you think we see it work in our Facebook community comment section every day. 
It's not uncommon if someone new to it comes in guns a blazing and then they get moderated down by the community, which will debate ideas but will not uh, tolerate direct personal attacks uh, or uh, uh, things of that nature. So uh, you can see that it actually it can work in some forms. At it least does anyway. work. Uh, issue number four, we go to Larry Schultz. Yes. Um, does the panel think that Texas and Florida are going to pay any price for defying the U.S. courts and sending National Guard troops uh, to the border? All right, Kenny, you were in the Guard. Talk to me. Um, well, the Guard has a use. Um if the state wishes to call them up to perform a duty, oh, well, they already do that. We do that here in, in corrections. Uh, the southern states, uh, let's say Texas, uses them to take some of the roles, uh, administrator roles for uh, border border guards, et cetera. So, but my thing is this: you know what? You're defying a federal order, and this is what it's what we did with the redistricting. Well, some states did redistricting. What's the Supreme Court? going to do when a state or a person defies their order that's what it comes down to what are they going to do now i'm all for sending our troops down there and if because they're understaffed and by the way this bill would hire more um attorneys would hire more judges would hire more border guards etc um but we won't care about that we'll just activate the guard get them away from their homes and family and their other jobs um, and go down there because apparently our political leaders don't want to do their own jobs, but use this as a political bludgeoning uh, to get things done because it's politically expedient and it looks better for a certain political individual, whether it be Republican or Democrat. So um, yeah, send the guard down there and do what needs to be done because it has to be. We're short staffed. You know, somebody's got to fill it in. I'd rather have a border guard fighting illegal immigration uh, than fighting fatigue. So catching fentanyl that's coming across our border than fighting fatigue. So um, I'm all for it. But, you know, we still got to look at our our elected leaders to do that job to relieve that burden uh, on our guard, because there's things going on in the world that we may need our National Guard for. Natural disasters, et cetera. Then we're going to become short-staffed. That's my view. Larry, does that answer your question? Um, uh, well, maybe it's a, a sign that the question wasn't as good as it could have been. Specifically, the Texas National Guard has kept the U.S. Border Patrol away from the actual border. And that was what the court said you cannot do. And so if we need the National Guard for any purpose of that nature, sure, they're going to be used. If the guard and the governors who control them uh, tend to go past that, violate federal law, and stop the Border Patrol from doing what it, uh, it has been charged with doing, then there's going to be a problem similar um, to getting the kids into the schools in Little Rock in 1954. If the state governors defy the federal courts, you will likely see sooner or later either a court or the executive tell that National Guard to stand down, and they have the power to do it. Um, the, the National Guard's purpose is never to conflict with other federal employees in the, uh, the in doing their job. Ken, does that change your answer? A little bit, yeah, because um, when it, when it, if, if you want them to work with federal employees, they have to be federalized. Then they're under the um, the uh, Secretary of Defense and the President as in Commander in Chief. And that and any time that they could be recalled is the governor going, "Hey, we don't need him anymore. Um, stand down." But at that point, that has to be okayed by the Secretary of Defense. So um, yeah, if you're just using them as state, yeah, you do have a problem um, because now you have federal agents against quote-unquote state agents, and you, you put these soldiers in a, in a predicament that they're there to follow orders, and now their orders are conflicting with some of their oaths, and who do we, do, who do we talk to? And it creates, a, it creates a, a problem that we don't need and a tension um, that can cause some problems. And, um, yeah, thanks for the, the clarification. So. Billy? 
Yeah, uh, we got to keep in mind the role of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is not an operational body. It is the del deliberative body that looks at laws and see how closely they adhere to the Constitution. Uh, there's uh, following Supreme Court uh, uh, decisions, there have been certain instances where the states have rea have acted uh, in nationalizing the National Guard. We, we hear Arkansas mentioned quite a bit. We cannot forget Kent State. Kent State was another example where it went went bad very very quickly uh, but so I I do not know if they're going to pay a price we have several things recently that the Supreme Court has ruled on uh, that uh, the states take object objection to the voting rights uh, decision in Alabama uh, uh, and the uh, the legislative makeup in North Carolina there's several of these that the Supreme Court has made a uh, has given a ruling but let's keep in mind the role of the Supreme Court is not an operational role. It is an interpretive role. Mr. Carl. Well, first of all, it's important that there there is no legally final ruling by the U.S. Supreme Court that Texas cannot protect its border uh, and in the detail, you know, how that happens is, you know, is, is, is something of a administrative clash, but, but that you, the Supreme Court will never take away Texas's right to protect its border. And, and the longer that the national government under the Biden administration fails to protect the Texas border, the stronger is the Texas state of Texas's duty to protect its border. Mr. Gilstrap. I think we need to be clear, make sure we're talking the same terms. It's nothing in the Supreme Court order says that Texas cannot put up barbed wire. What the order says is that they can't stop the Border Patrol from taking it down, which means that Texas can put it back. So what this has become, I, I don't know that anybody is actually, I don't think we've come to blows. Nobody's shooting each other uh, with, with the, the uh, Customs and Border Protection. In fact, CBP, when you talk about, you know, they're there to do their jobs, they're, one could argue that their job is not to make sure that everybody can cross the border and enter the United States unimpeded. One might argue that their actual job is to do their actual job, which is to control immigration. So I think what we've done, and I, the um, Governor Abbott in particular, has created this really embarrassing photo op for the administration that happens to have vastly slowed down illegal immigration. When you put barbed wire across the, the Rio Grande, it's, it's hard to get through it. It's not actually barbed wire. It's razor wire. Well, when, when you kill children, that does have people making Look, step you know, Obama back. didn't care about killing children. I don't want to get into the killing children thing. That is such... Forgive me. Yeah. That, that, that's just not a talking point. You know, that's, that's, that's a bomb. That's, that's, that's not a debate topic. Go ahead, finish your point. So the, the point is, nobody's breaking the law here. The, Texas is doing what they're allowed to do under the Supreme Court decision, and whether Biden is is telling the Border Patrol to take down the, the barbed wire or not, I don't know. But Texas is perfectly le it's perfectly legal for them to put it back. Nobody's violated the law. So I'm not sure where the high dudgeon's coming from. Yeah, in all due respect to my good friend, colleague, <laughs> John Gilstrap, and notice the word I use, respect. The Supreme Court did tell Texas to remove the wire that was in the middle of the Rio Grande. Now, where we're talking about keeping the federal troops away uh, is a different location. But they did tell Texas they had to take down the, that wire in the middle of the Rio Grande. Larry, final point goes back to you. Um, I, I simply think that um, for something where uh, there is such a good opportunity pending right now to make a decision as uh, on the part of lawmakers and make a deal and get this done um they're turning it into a mess i mean florida uh has no in their national guard has no interest in protecting the texas border but they're see he's sending those people too uh at some point if the abuses continue uh and they don't remove the wire i do believe that that the president will uh federalize those two sets of national guards yes and when he does 
uh, there'll be great hue and cry, even though, this is classic, every dime of the pay of every one of those National Guards ones comes not out of my state taxes, but out of my federal taxes. Every dime of their pay. Now, there's some other money that the states put in, but it ain't very much. So, it, this is a classic federal government helping uh, states situation. When we had floods in West Virginia, the National Guard was all over it. And they did tremendous work. There was nobody else to do it. And that's a wonderful thing. But let's not pretend that it's not a social program because that's exactly what it is. And on that note, we move on to our anchor leg in the final issue of the day, number five, with Mr. Michael Carl. I have just a simple question uh, for the panelists. Uh, if Trump is so bad, why have his... Uh, support from black Americans and and Spanish Americans continued to increase. It started in 2016 election and it continued in 2020 and, and the current polls are showing that it's continuing even more. If he's so bad, how can that be? All right, uh, Bill, why don't you go first on this one? Yeah. And, at, and everybody try to limit yourself to one minute on okay. this. It depends on where your starting point. Uh, 2018, there was a massive shift if you compare it to 2018. If you compare it to 2020, a much less shift. Uh, plus the fact that if you look at the numbers of the various populations, they're still uh, uh, predominant those are going to vote for Trump. So the trend may be uh, 50 years down the road, Mike, that may make a difference, but not in the next election. Kenny? I will counter uh, with this. If Trump is so good, why is his polls among women uh, continually to go downhill? Um, so polls, I think, in this regard, really mean nothing. It gives you a small glimpse, but nothing to, to, to really hang your hat on. Um, if you're polling – all right, I did this. Of a maximum – of all the people that voted last, last year or the last election, total of 158,397,726 people voted. And I'm going to supposed to take a, a snapshot of what the people of the nation really feel when only 300 to 1,000 people are polled. And where are they polled? Right? So um, you take this with a grain of salt. And, um, you know, this is where debates come, in, come into and actually researching what's really going on. But, you know, we've already discussed here ad nauseum in regards to polls in West Virginia. So, um, you know. My, my thought that, that's my thing is is the general feeling of the country we all see that we all hear that but to, to go off of polls and some of this person's sliding that person's sliding as i said you know with, with trump women's going down even further so give or take um but i wouldn't i wouldn't have someone claim their hat or put their hat on something like Oh, I got this many voting block. I got this voting block. It, it ebbs and waves depending on how people feel their economy and their life is going. Mr. Carl, his question was, uh, if Trump is so bad, why are his numbers among minorities going up? Mr. Gilstrap, what's the answer? I want to go to the first one, not the second one. And the, the, the reason that the poll numbers are going down in the minority areas is because government is suborning lawlessness. We see as, as more and more people die because of the lack of police support, which was supported by the left, we're seeing company, uh, uh, stores, major chain stores leaving major cities in droves because they can't handle the, the burden of shoplifting anymore. I think that the, the, uh, the minority population, the city popul inner city population, is, is really oppressed right now it's it they're they're lawless places and um no nobody wants that i think that the democratic party has been using the uh racial minorities as as symbols for things for which they are not actually symbols instead of treating them like people who need help mr schultz um i guess my view of this is similar to ken's i don't know enough about these uh polls to know whether we can count on them or not. I do know that there's one very important poll that will take place in November. And the last time we had one of those, I seem to recall that Mr. Trump spent an awful lot of time saying it was bogus. So, and that, that was a poll that was done on paper by people who had to sign their names. Uh, 
and uh, and uh, I had to register to vote before they uh, wow. did it or not, huh? Um, uh, they had 60 cases and they never proved a thing. So I'm not too worried about some polls today and what they say about minorities becoming more popular with Republicans uh, or, or Republicans becoming more popular with minorities. I guess I can say that both ways. I don't think that that's going to be a factor in any race. Comes back to you, Michael. The, the, the only th- – I, I agree with these points about polls. I'm very cynical about the accuracy of polls. But the, the truth is that the election results in 2016 and 2020 in districts which are heavily uh, populated by black Americans and, and, and Spanish Americans shifted to Trump overall. Bill, you recently had something at the Stubblefield Institute that included a, a reputable pollster yes. on board. So uh, the tendency when we cite a poll is if we like the poll, we think it's scientific. If we don't, we discredit the poll. And, and that held true in the room here as well. Yeah. Just about, about 40 seconds or so, what does your pollster tell you? Well, I did not ask this specific question, but uh, we're trying to get him on for some future appearance on the show. He's... He's, he's a very smart man. He's easy to listen to. He's smart. So I hope we can do that. But going back to Mike's point, uh, he's right, and yet he's not totally right, in my view. Uh, one, Mike he is, is always right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mike is right in the regard that there has been a trend of in the minorities to shift from Republican to, to I mean, to Democrat to Republican. Uh, it was much larger in 2016 than it was in 2020. But where I disagree with Mike is still 73% of the Asians, black, and Latino voters backed the Democrats. Uh, and that, so... Uh, so they're compared yeah. to ninety five percent in the past. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah, Mike, but that's that's that's. that's I'm, I'm not that, saying they're. I'm conceding that point, but I'm, I'm making the point is there's still the vast majority are still voting for Democrats. But when that number dips below ninety, as I've read it in the past, that can be enough to start to tip elections. Yes. Well, it's already below ninety because yeah. it's a substantial below ninety. And that, I think that was Mike's point there yeah, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No one's saying that. Just keep an eye on it, of course. Kenny, thank you. <laughs> I managed to suppress that cough all all hour long. (laughs) Hey, final thoughts are coming up next. I get yours together now. You get eight seconds to get them in. We get back from the break. And uh, final thoughts are brought to you by Larry DeMarco and company at Modern Realty Results. After a car accident, what do you get when you call Mansion Ferretti? You get more experience from a local law firm with over 115 years of combined service. More respect from a team who treats clients like their own family. And more fight because we want you to get every dollar you deserve. Experience, respect, results. If you've been injured, that's what you want in your lawyer. And that's what you'll get when you call us. Car accident? Get more with Mansion Ferretti. 304-264-8505. Kick off the new year in a new Chevy from CMA's Chevrolet of Martinsburg. We've got a great selection of new Chevy models on our lot. Right now, save up to $9,000 off MSRP on a new 2024 Silverado 1500 Crew Cab. Or check out a new 2024 Equinox and save up to $3,500 off MSRP. And did we mention every new car comes with Chevy Complete Care and our lifetime powertrain warranty? Find new roads at CMA Chevrolet of Martinsburg.com, where owners just care more. Hi, Crescia Hornby here. Larry DeMarco, broker of Modern Realty Results, believes he has some of the best real estate agents in the Eastern Panhandle. Agents at Modern Realty Results have years of experience and knowledge of the local real estate market. Agents within the office work as a team to provide quality customer service. We strive to always ensure client satisfaction through handling every transaction with honesty and integrity, all while offering competitive rates. Modern Realty Results is veteran owned and managed. Please call us at 262-4222, modernrealtyresults.com. It's the return of West Virginia High School Boys Basketball on TV10, featuring the Eastern Panhandle Athletic Conference. 
Barkley's got the steal all by himself. Will go up for the two-handed slam dunk. Join us for the 2023-2024 season as we'll have over 40 games of EPAC Boys Hoops. Our first broadcast is December 6th. We'll take you all the way through the regional championships. It's EPAC Boys Basketball on Talk Radio WRNR and TV 10. Final thoughts. We always start on the phone. Ken Matson. In the words of their mighty poet, peace, love, and soul. Mr. Schultz. Uh, Punxsutawney Phil says, we're getting an early spring. Mr. Stubblefield. Next month, uh, next week, rather, the Supreme Court's taking up probably one of the most uh, meaningful decisions of, the, of our lifetime. The 14th Amendment, how does it apply to Donald Trump? Mr. Carl. This Saturday, the Mountaineer basketball continues its recovery by with an upset of BYU. Mr. Gilstrap. Everybody needs to gather friends together who disagree and have conversations like this. Hey, we got them all in in time today. Good yeah. job, guys. Dave Ramsey's show is coming up next. This is Talk Radio, WRR, Martinsburg, and TV 10. And we'll talk to you again in 70 short hours.